Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you there in person or even closer virtually. I'm down here in Los Angeles where I'm the emergency manager for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, before I get into the presentation, just a tiny bit of my background, um, especially for you school people, most of my career has been in the school districts. I started as a classroom teacher. I taught for, oh gosh, maybe 15 years. I was a, a dean. I did other out of classroom positions, testing coordinator, things like that. Uh, found my way into the emergency management office here because after teaching for about 10 years, I took a job with one of our local fire departments. And then I was a police officer with LAPD for a while and then came back to the school district. So emergency management gives me a really interesting fit of all of those experiences when I'm doing it for a school district because it makes everything uh, relevant, which is just kind of lovely. So that's me. And in terms of our experience with earthquake early warning, I want to give you a bit of an overview of LAUSD, um, which is the second largest school district in the country. Um, we're taking care of a lot of kids. We have about 640,000 K-12 students. We also have about 100,000 adult school students. Um, I think about another 100,000 early ed students, and those are preschoolers. Uh, we have 82,000 special ed students. We have about 80,000 employees. How many schools we have really kind of depends on how you count them. It's about 1,000. We have some that have multiple schools on one campus, and they may all be district schools. We have a lot of charters in LAUSD, and some of those are co-located onto an LAUSD campus along with LAUSD school. And we cover 710 square miles. And it really ranges. We've got a school that's a block from the beach. We've got one that's hanging off of a cliff. We've got one with horse trails running past the front gate of the school. So um, uh, a lot of variation in what we do and how we do it. So generally, in terms of disaster response at school, it really kind of comes down to four things. You're either going to evacuate the buildings, you're going to relocate to somewhere else, you're going to shelter in place, or you're going to go into a lockdown. And an earthquake is a little bit different from that because you do the drop cover and hold on, followed by a building evacuation. At least that's what we do. In California, all the public schools are required to have an emergency, man emergency plan by California law, and they are required to be updated annually. Um, I've created a, a, a giant template for our school, and then each school puts in their updated contact information and some mapping and locations on their own. Next one, go to the next slide for me. Why isn't this moving? There we go. So this is a little bit of a look at what our emergency plans consist of. I have it in two formats, one in an app. Um, this is a look at the employee and first responder version of our app, and then also online where they create and update the plan. Um, and every person who works at their school site can access their emergency plan. Now, of course, in California, we're fairly used to earthquakes, and it's actually kind of, it's the big thing that we prepare for. Lockdowns are our most frequent emergency. We literally have lockdowns every day in LAUSD, almost always uh, police activity in the neighborhood. Um, but uh, aside from active shooter, our biggest threat that we think about is earthquakes because that is for us in, in Los Angeles. It's a when, it's not an if. And uh, there's a lot that's packed into earthquake preparedness because there are a lot of other things that can happen. You'll still get uh, different types of emergencies that happen along with it. We do have several laws that help us um, maintain our preparedness at the school level in California. Um, these won't apply to you in the Pacific Northwest. One thing that is unique in California is the Disaster Service Worker Act, which means that every public employee, including all school district employees and all charter employees, uh, in a disaster, if it's been declared or proclaimed, they are considered disaster service workers. And for us at the school site, that means that we need to stay on campus with the kids until they've all been picked up and we can be assigned to other disaster duties as well. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on our relevant laws. That's kind of, I put that in there just because a lot of times um, people aren't really familiar with the, the laws. 
One of the other things that is, is uh, kind of unique in California is that we have the Field Act, and the Field Act was put in place many years ago uh, because of a damaging earthquake that damaged a lot of schools and actually destroyed many schools. So the Field Act actually specifies that California public schools are built to a higher construction sta standard and they're inspected more frequently throughout that construction process to make them more resilient to earthquakes so they're less likely to fall down which does mean that in an earthquake, our school buildings still may be standing, unless it's a giant cataclysmic earthquake, but um, we'll still have damage inside from contents, and because our school buildings are still standing when other buildings may have been uh, destroyed, it makes them actually more likely to be used as public shelters following an earthquake. And because we are, we, we know that earthquakes are kind of a persistent threat for us, we actually plan for, we have a three-day supply of um, uh, emergency supplies and equipment on every campus um, to help us following an earthquake. Um, because all of our campuses are fully gated. After an earthquake, we take care of the kids until each and every one of them is reunited with the custodial parent. And when we have damages such as the bridge that you can see here, it's going to take a while for these parents to get back to the school site to pick up their child. Um, there are a lot of people in Los Angeles that have really enormous commutes, sometimes across multiple counties. You know, people may work, you know, an hour and a half from home on a good day. And in an earthquake, that commute could be drastically altered if it's possible to get where you're going from where you're coming from and if the person is in fact uninjured. So we do plan to be there for quite a while. So we feel that if we have a three-day supply of everything on our campuses, then as some, it'll actually last us longer than three days because as those kids are picked up, it will allow the remaining supplies to be used until, until every child has been reunited with their parent. And we have procedures, supplies, we do training, we participate in the shakeout every year in October, and we run that as a full-scale earthquake drill where we activate all of our emergency teams and practice all of our relevant emergency procedures. There we go. So in terms of Shake Alert, we've been involved with Shake Alert for quite a while, the earthquake early warning. So we started with, uh, we actually have the desktop computer beta test running on a few different computers in the district. And then um, in 2015, we actually put it um, out at one of our high schools. There was a big press conference. Um, earthquake early warning is very important to uh, the LA City Mayor, Eric Garcetti. And so he really wanted to, to, to make sure that we had a, a robust um, involvement with the schools. Um, and by the way, we are not a city department. We actually cover multiple jurisdictions um, but we still maintain a good working relationship with LA City, of course. So we went into one of our high schools. Uh, Eagle Rock High is an old high school. Many of our schools are multiple buildings, but the bulk of this, this high school was built, oh gosh, I think maybe 100 years ago. It's quite old. And we installed it on all of the desktop computers in all of the science classrooms. And they've been running that since 2015. They actually use it in their disaster drills. They've incorporated it into their their earthquake drills, and in their science instruction. So it's kind of neat when you get into one of these classrooms where these kids have actually, they're able to actually go into the computers and look at all of the data that's been coming in from various earthquakes. So we've been running that for quite a while um, and very successfully. And then recently we we're working with one of the vendors and he has provided us with three devices and you can see them here. I, I'm kind of, I'm not a scientist by the way, and um, I'm not the, I'm not the uh, tech expert either, but I'd always kind of imagined these devices that we would actually be hooking into our PA systems would kind of look like a VCR or a, a cable box or something, and I'm kind of relieved that it actually kind of does look like what, uh, what I expected it to look like. And this is a picture of one of the devices, and um, we temporarily stuck it into the computer racks in our downtown uh, district headquarters before moving it off to the school site. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like up and running in action. We just wanted to make sure that it worked. And so the pilot that we're doing is to put these actual physical devices 
into three of our uh, three of our schools. It's a no cost uh, pilot project um, that we're doing with the vendor, and most of the earthquake early warning that we will be doing is through these hardwired devices. And uh, it connects fairly easily, and it's the sort of thing that our IT people assure us that as they do more and more, then the install will get faster and faster. And it's really more a, mat um, uh, a matter of making sure that the different components are recognizing one another. And it just sits there in the computer rack in the PA system. It doesn't require, this particular device does not require uh, going through an actual computer as well. Um, and right now, I'm working with our IT department and our maintenance and operations department on actually getting them installed. We actually have the three devices, and now it's a matter of getting them installed. And then, sorry, I'm having a little trouble advancing these slides. Here we go. So we've also done something else. Um, I applied for a Cal OES hazardous mitigation grant to cover these other schools. So our schools range over uh, they range, the build, the build date on our schools ranges over 100 years. We have a couple of schools that were built in the late 1800s, and then we have many that are new. We built 100 schools in the last 10 years. Uh, we're done with that building project. And then we've been upgraded, grading some of the PA systems in our schools. So about 40 to 50 of our schools have these upgraded PA systems. And from what our IT department tells me, the rest of the schools, if they get upgraded, it's going to be a long, long time from now. Those other schools will all need the hardwired version. But with these 40 schools with these upgraded PA systems, it's really neat because you can, you can uh, put the earthquake early warning system in there, just the software. You don't have to go to the schools. You don't have to touch any devices. Literally, everything can be done over the air. They can be tested over the air. Um, it makes it a lot simpler and easier for them to do. They can all be updated all at once. Um, so I put in for that grant once we realized that there was an over-the-air application uh, that would be a separate sort of um, system going in, and I'm waiting to hear back on that now. So all we really need to make sure on our end is that it meets our internet security requirements. We have pretty strict internet security requirements because of the student data that we house. And the grant does require a 25% matching fund, which is a bit of an ongoing issue. Um, we are not, uh, let's see, funds are tight, let's just say that, and I'm still looking for that uh, hard commitment on the district side. The nice thing is, is that we've been told that those matching funds can come from staff time. So if I can get people to monitor the testing of it and things, we can count that as our match. It doesn't have to be cash in hand. Um, so that's going to be really beneficial, and do consider that in any um, grant applications that you're going for. Find out if they can use um, staff time, existing staff time, to cover that. My biggest lessons learned in all of this work with ShakeAlert is to make sure that you get commitment from the units that you're going to be working with ahead of time. I had started on the hardwire installed uh, version. I'd been working with our, our maintenance and operations department, m and And then I realized uh, they actually switched the project from being m and I got a phone call from the head of our m and and the head of this one part of our IT department, like, hey, Jill, we decided we're gonna, this is going to be an IT lead, okay? And it meant almost starting everything over because all of the people on the IT side weren't familiar with the project, and some of the things that m and was saying, yeah, no problem, we can do that. IT had a different view of what it would take and the testing that would be involved. And um, I should have thought more deeply about interfacing with both of those departments ahead of time. Uh, I tend to just say yes and then try to figure things out. That isn't always the most efficient way of doing it. And making sure who's going to have the oversight of it. Um, and that's an issue that we're still kind of softballing back and forth because it can all default to emergency services, which is my department, which is me, um, but I can't go out there and do any of the technical work behind it. I can't, I can't test the system myself. I don't have that technical expertise or the install expertise. Um, so making sure that you have that commitment from anybody else that may be involved is, is great if you can get that done ahead of time. 
So the reason that I was so interested in having the earthquake early warning technology in our schools is because of the life safety protection factor that it gives us. Um, what it does is it gives us extra time to take those protective actions. In LA, we'll be lucky to get 30 seconds. It's probably gonna be more like 10, but that does give us that additional time to drop cover and hold on, make sure that our people are protected, uh, and reducing those chances of injury from the contents in our buildings. Gives us a chance to turn off the Bunsen burners in the science labs, um, stash things in the kitchens at our schools quickly. I find that it's really important for students with disabilities, for the kids who are in wheelchairs. Uh, it provides time if the child can't really, doesn't have the mobility themselves to, uh, to move themselves. We have a lot of kids that are in power wheelchairs and really can't move at all on their own, and they have an aid assigned to them, but it allows that aid or that student, just as they're able, to roll themselves into that protected corner of the classroom and lock the wheels on the wheelchair and get that employee time to get themselves and to drop cover and hold on. Our special ed personnel are very sweet and they, they, they keep telling me that, oh no, 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 it's, it's fine, I'm just going to throw myself over that student and protect them and I'm like, well that's great but we need you too so you need to get that student protected and then protect yourself because we're gonna need you too. I find that with Shake Alert, it's gonna be really valuable for our students with um, some cognitive delays and the students with autism that need that extra processing time and if you're an educator, you know the ones I'm talking about. Those ones that when you're trying to get them to do something and they have that, that freeze that comes in before the processing kicks in and then they move, this is gonna give them that extra time. Uh, we have some special ed centers that are entirely comprised of students with multiple severe needs and it's gonna be really invaluable for those, uh, those schools to have that extra, whether it's 10 seconds, 30 seconds, to get prepared and, and get things um, in aligned so that they can make sure that everyone's protected. I think it's gonna be really valuable too for the younger students, especially those, those primary grades, the ones who they might need a little extra time, they might need that reminder, they might need somebody to model for them what drop cover and hold on looks like. In uh, California, or at least in our schools, we're, we do an earthquake, a drop cover and hold on um, drill every month. Just drop cover and hold on, not with the building evacuation, but we do that every month. So by the end of first grade, the kids know exactly what to do, but you know, it takes the little ones a little bit of time. The early ed, the ones that are out in the preschools, we actually have 10 infant centers. We have babies coming to school. So this will give everybody that, that extra time I really think is gonna be the most valuable por portion of being involved in earthquake early warning for us. I think it does actually add to our resilience as, uh, as a school district, it makes us better at dealing with the emergencies that are going to come because when you look at disaster resilience, you're not even looking at the bounce back from an emergency, you're looking at that bounce forward capacity. What is this doing and what is Shake Alert doing to help us become better prepared the next time? And I really think because it's, it's giving us the extra connect time, it gives people a chance to think a little more deeply um, and anytime we can get anybody uh, attending to any of the emergency needs, then the better off we'll all be when something like that happens. So the downside for this is there is some cost. Um, it does, it's, it's not particularly costly from what I know already, although the solutions seem to be in an early enough stage that uh, the, cost, the cost on it may change over time. And then there is some time involved. Most of that time is gonna be mine other than the install. And I, I, I think it's well worth the time that it's gonna to take to be involved. So the most important thing to realize about participating in earthquake early warning is from the school side is that it doesn't change what we do. We still drop cover and hold on. It just means that we're doing it earlier. So it doesn't change any of our procedures. It's interesting because sometimes people get really hung up and okay, but Jill, then you're gonna to have to go out and you're gonna to have to retrain people. Well, not really because what is our indication now? We don't get a warning for an earthquake. Your indicator is the ground shakes and then you drop cover and hold on. So all this does, all we need to do is really train ourselves and train the educators in the schools to either be aware that they may be getting an audible alert over the PA system or over some other means. And if they don't get it, then they're still of course going to drop cover and hold when they feel the shaking. So it's gonna be a simple uptake to our, our procedures and I think integrating it is gonna be very, very simple for our schools. I know in the devices that we have, um, 
they will actually be able to use it when they're doing their drills as well. And I think that's really going to be beneficial for the school because they're going to be able to um, integrate that. And then, of course, the nice thing about integrating it at the schools is that when earthquake early warning systems kind of roll out into the public, our students will already be prepared and they'll be able to carry those lessons home with them and help their families be prepared as well. So this is just a little slide to remind people of the different types of disabilities that we deal with at um, our schools. We have an entire school uh, called Marlton, which is for deaf and hard of hearing, and it is an ASL program. So the students' families elect to send them there if they want their child uh, to become fluent in ASL, American Sign Language, and more than half of the stuff is deaf as well because who is fluent in ASL, other deaf people. So that actually requires an entirely different system because they have one of those big video systems. Um, so when it get, comes time to including Marlton in that, that's actually going to be a different system integration because we're going to have to integrate that into their existing communications. And because some of those, those students can't read, especially if they're new to school or they're the preschoolers that are on that campus, that system will actually include a visual of drop, cover, and hold on as a reminder because just flashing the words when you have a preliterate population isn't necessarily going to give everybody that protective factor that we're looking for. And um, all of these other disabilities that you see here, I'm sure you have some of these in your schools as well. And um, you know, the nice thing with earthquake early warning is it really does help protect everyone. I have, let's see, where's my next slide? Come on, come on up. There we go. I put my contact information up here so that if anybody would like to reach out to me at any time, this is how you can best get a hold of me. The bottom thing is my website where I have a lot of emergency related um, uh, information and documents for our schools. Because we're so big and I'm a one person office, um, my website sometimes does is my best advocate for what I want people to do with our emergency stuff. So if you're ever looking for any sort of emergency resources, you may help yourself to anything that you find. Um, I'm more than happy to help you with any issues that you're working through um, and because I think we can learn from each other and, and we all benefit when we are all better prepared. And with that, if anybody has any questions, um, I think someone was going to monitor the chat, which I, I don't see the chat. Wait, maybe I can. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Great presentation. Yeah, so I think what we'll do is we'll take some questions right now uh, before we move into the next presentation. Is anybody here? Does anybody here have any questions? Uh, if you, anyone online has questions, please type it into the chat window and then we can, uh, we can relay those. What online? We have a question that came in from Taryn Moore. Um, have you found any resistance from stakeholders to the earthquake early warning pilot? Not at all. Actually, it's um, I, I find that our administrators on our campuses are actually um, kind of relieved to, to have it when I've approached them about it because because earthquake is a no notice event, we don't get any advance warning of it now. So the idea that something is going to tell them that an earthquake is going to come, even if it's just 10 seconds of preparedness, um, they are more than happy to implement it. The only resistance that I have found is when I've approached both our maintenance and operations and our IT division and basically asked them to incorporate this into their work and I don't have any money for them to do so. <laughs> That's where, if any resistance, it's how can we how can we implement this? How can we get it into our schools? And how can you do it while you're doing everything else you're doing? Please and thank you, because they don't have any funding to give them. All right. Yes, yeah, funding is tough. All right. Next question. Uh, I think it's on the reader. Um, have you had any issues with false alerts, and how have you addressed that if so? We haven't really had a lot of issues with false alerts. Uh, for one thing, we can set the, the level at which the alert goes off. So it is something that if we get a lot of false alerts, we can actually, and, and actually, I, I don't know that there are a lot of false alerts, but 
there's a there's a tipping point where if you set it too low, it's going to detect earthquakes is going to go going to go off for smaller earthquakes that you can't even really feel, and people are going to perceive that as a false alert. However, if you set it too high to only go off for larger earthquakes, then people are going to feel that it doesn't work because if you if you feel a little bit of a tremble and it's a small earthquake and the system hasn't alerted, then people are going to assume it didn't work. Um, we're also fairly early in the install version. However, the plan really is, if there is a false alert, read it like your monthly drop cover and hold on. And you're really not losing a lot. I mean, if, if the system goes off and you drop cover and hold on and no earthquake occurs and then you go back to learning as usual, you're really not even losing a lot of instructional time for this. Thank you. We do have a question inside the room too. What do you do with post messages? So after start. I'm sorry, broke up a little bit. Can you repeat? What do you do with post messaging? So after the alert, uh, what do you tell uh, administrators, students, and parents? Well, for us, um, we're so big that uh, the, the way an earthquake is going to be felt in one portion of our district isn't going to be felt the same way and the, the damages aren't going to be the same in the other end of our district. So a lot of that messaging, we will have some messaging that would be, that would apply to the entire district in terms of we've experienced an earthquake and we're evaluating, um, we're evaluating things as they go. In terms of individual schools, because a lot of them will have to do their own alerting, we do have a large mass messaging system. We use Blackboard Connect, and we use the heck out of it because we use it for we use it for everything. Every kid who's absent from one class gets a Blackboard Connect message home every day in the district. Um, plus, they use it for all of their other ordinary announcements. So our administrators are very used to doing. Um, Regular announcements on Blackboard Connect are very familiar with the system. Uh, we have some messages staged in the system that they can kind of adapt to their needs. We haven't yet done those for specific to earthquake early warning, but it would be similar to other alerts that we've had. If, if the school has uh, the fire drill, if someone has pulled the fire alarm, say, and the school is evacuated, then there is a message that goes home to the parents reassuring them that everything is fine and that they did, that this did happen. And if there are um, injuries and damages, then we would send out appropriate messaging uh, on that as well. We don't have any of that pre-staged, which I wish that we did. Um, but, uh, I do have someone from our Office of Communications in my Emergency Operations Center, so if we need to come up with custom announcements that, that have to do with particular <laughs> we can deal with that in the moment if we haven't pre-staged it. Thank you. We had a couple of quick questions about costs on here. Um, so one is just what is the average cost to install the system that you have right now? And then uh, are there any ongoing costs associated with that? Um, I don't actually have any cost information because of uh, the, the work that we're doing with the vendor right now is um, cost neutral to the district and we don't have a big contract yet for the rest of the install and everything we've had to do so far is really just kind of estimating things um, because it's new enough that we don't have good predictive costs. And the cost for us, I'll tell you, at anything that we do at this scale, um, we have found that for us, anything that is priced per site or priced per student does not, that, that, that cost never works when you scale it out to a thousand schools. So we always have to, for a big, if we were to go do a full scale install of earthquake early warning at every single school in the district, we would actually have to take that out to an RFP process and get a, a you know, a, a custom bid on that. And we're not there yet. Um, we need to make sure that we've got what we've got up and running well for a while first before we pursue that. Um, so I honestly, I can't even really give you any cost. Because right now I'm trying to get people to do it for me just because they should do it. Because <laughs> I don't have any money for them. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more here. One is just uh, 
how have you considered the site-specific information, like, for example, doing things in different buildings, like, a, in addition to the we talked about, maybe a gymnasium, are there additional considerations for actions? Well, we have some um, uh, site-specific, and then um, a lot of our schools, I'm not familiar with how your schools are up there in the Pacific Northwest, but a lot of our schools are open air, I call them like motel style, where every classroom will open to the outside because we don't have weather in California, at least we don't have weather here in Los Angeles, so we don't have to worry about that. And we have a lot of campuses that are made of multiple buildings, and sometimes even on a campus we may have uh, buildings that have been built over a, a, a 50 year spread, say. Um, so sometimes we do need to have some very specific procedures that apply on one part of campus that don't, and then of course also the use of a building. Um, with the earthquake early warning, uh, it wouldn't really change any of those procedures. That system wouldn't wouldn't be any different than the earthquake procedures that we use now that are site specific. Okay, and one more we have for now. There should be some more about um, some other people might contact you with more specific information about costs and try to connect with that. Um, but in the meantime, there was some mention earlier about turning off power systems. Um, are there any, do you have any thoughts for extending what earthquake early warning is currently doing at the LA school district? Uh, we wouldn't even be able to really turn off power systems at the schools um, in, in that way. Um, a lot of the, the automated systems that are in place when, when I hear about what other industries are doing with earthquake early warning, um, our systems are not generally the latest and greatest. We don't have key card entry to our schools. You know, we're just using keys. Um, we don't have a lot of amazing new tech. <laughs> we're not on the forefront of things. Uh, so we're fairly old school in that way. So we wouldn't be shutting down power systems. We don't have a lot of, of giant systems that are interconnected where we would be able to get to them in enough time to shut things down. It was more simple things like, you know, if the dude is, is trimming trees with a chainsaw, he should get out of the tree and shut off the chainsaw before the earthquake hits. Um, maybe raising some garage doors on, um, on vehicle bays because we do have uh, school bus yards and things like that only because you know, door frames are one, that tweak in an earthquake are one of the most frequent things. So being able to have those open so that we can use vehicles post, we would be doing, but not a lot of things that are system automated. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, I'm sure we'll have some people following up with you afterwards. So really appreciate your time to letting us know how it works. Oh, sure, of course.